my name is Jim Carlson. I'm president of the Clay Mathematics Institute. Uh, the Clay Institute was founded in 2000, <laughs> in 1999, so this is actually the 10th anniversary. It was founded by a very generous and visionary gift, of Landon T. Clay. Uh, and we're very proud to present uh, this conference at Harvard University uh, today, tomorrow. And we're very grateful to Harvard for its hospitality. Our first speaker is Herwig Hauser, on leave from the University of Innsbruck, now at the University of Vienna. Uh, Professor Hauser has worked in algebraic geometry and singularity theory. And as you will see, he is uh, also extremely adept at the production of high quality computer graphics. So without uh, any further ado, I introduce Herwig. Thank you, Tim. <coughs> Good morning. <coughs> I'm very pleased to be here, but also the field of resolution of singularities is very pleased to be presented here. In the second talk, Hazuki Hironaka will give his view on the open problems in characteristic P and in the arithmetic case. And I think that I will try to give you more a general picture what is the state of the art at the moment? I'm often asked, what happens in characteristic P? Is it solved or not? And I'll try to give you some idea where the problem is and uh, what we may expect in the future. So in order to give you a general impression, I will start first with singularities. And then we will have a look at characteristic 0. Because without understanding characteristic zero, we cannot really judge what are the problems in characteristic P. And then I will give you some uh, results on characteristic P. And if I have time at the end, I will indicate some possible new approaches which may be more, uh, more advantageous uh, to resolve the problem. So this talk is not for experts, and uh, but all of you are in some sense experts. So we start with this cylinder, and uh, I want to show in a small video clip how singularities arise. Now I'm sorry for the quality of the pictures. That's always the problem with these animated GIFs, that uh, they are difficult to handle on a computer. So. Sometimes we may have kind of problems. So you see that this is getting more and more singular. There's a lot of cheating inside, but uh, let's neglect this. It's just to give you an impression. I leave a little bit the category of algebraic geometry to produce these pictures, but let's accept this. So now we have quite a singular surface, and the problem of resolution of singularities is to undo this creation of singularities. So we want to recover the cylinder, and we want to find a projection or a contraction yielding this singular surface. So it's kind of inverse problem. We start with something which is singular, so we could think that it is a shadow of something smooth, something smooth living in a big space, and you project it down, and you create singularities. But by chance, you have lost the projection, and you just have the image over there. And you want to find a way to reconstruct this projection and the smooth variety. So this would be kind of parameterization of your singularities by a manifold. That's the topic of, of resolution of singularities. In this sense, it is very geometric. But as it turns out, the proofs are very algebraic. So today, we will be mostly dramatic, but keep in mind that behind you have to do a lot of algebra, which is not really always motivated by geometry. <coughs> so <coughs> in order to, to find a resolution, you have one very simple device, which are blow-ups. The blow-up <coughs> is a modification of a variety given by a certain center. Outside the center, you leave it the same. And in the center, you kind of explode 
the point or the curve you take a center and so you try to improve your variety step by step that's not for me so I'm not going to define blow ups everybody knows what it is but I will show you uh, two pictures of these so imagine you start with a cylinder and you want to contract this circle you contract it to a point creating self a singularity and again I show it as a deformation but in in fact it is uh, one single map you contract this circle to a point and you get the cone and in in dark in gray you still see the cylinder so you have to imagine that this is just one step <coughs> and that just produced a family in order to have a nicer picture so <coughs> if you do this backwards you will have to take this center here the red point and you have to substitute it by a circle okay so when creating this circle you will realize that the inverse image is a whole plane because on the cylinder with the circle you have taken a perpendicular plane and you contracted it to one point so you have two you have two objects starting with the singularity you just have the cylinder as what is called the strict transform but you also have the total transform which is the whole inverse image and which has two components it is a hypersurface yellow and the cylinder which here by chance is also a hypersurface okay so you get this so that's the intuitive picture is we contract a hypersurface to a point or to a curve now if this hypersurface is tangent to our surface as in this picture here now contracting the surface means that you do it not only with this one but the nearby planes are contracted as well but they are not contracted to a point they are contracted to something smaller so it's kind of a quasi on, on each fiber it's a linear map <coughs> and if you start to contract you will see the following phenomenon you create a singularity which is of a different type it's a A2 singularity and uh, it looks a little bit different than the singularity of the cone okay. so this is the second type of singularity we meet and if we now take a blow up with this singular point as center you will get back the parboloid the smooth surface as before but for many applications we are not satisfied with this inverse image because the yellow plane is tangent to the smooth surface the yellow surface would be the resolution of the A2 singularity and the, the green sorry the green one is the resolution the total union of both components is the total transform so the inverse image but as they are tangent we still have a, a suboptimal configuration we want to make these transversal so the tangency here can be resolved by applying a further blow up and by applying a further blow up you will get a third component so now you have in green the strict transform of our A2 singularity and you have two exceptional components yellow and pink which cut into transversally at the point okay so this would be uh, what is called an embedded resolution I will come back to this so I will summarize the three concepts we are talking about so the first one is abstract resolution you have a singular variety x and what you want is 
a birational proper morphism with x prime smooth. So this abstract resolution is also called non-embedded resolution. We just look at the green component and not at the exceptional components. And moreover, we ask if thing x is a singular locus. We don't want to modify our variety outside the singular locus, so this should be isomorphism over x minus thing x. So for the surface we had at the beginning, I show you such a sequence of modifications. Now, this birational proper morphism is usually obtained by a sequence of blow-ups. And here, in the first picture, you take the most singular point as the center of blow-up. You get something like this. Now you blow up the line, which is kind of dotted, which is an artifact in this picture. And you get this picture, and then uh, blowing up again two lines, you get this one, which is not the cylinder yet. You have to do one more blow up, but you can imagine how the cylinder will result. Okay? So this is a sequence of blow ups. It's not necessary to do it like this, but everybody does. Okay? Now let's see if this works. Second, we have the notion, now I'm going to a stronger version of resolution. We have the notion of embedded resolution. We take now x embedded in some smooth ambient space. And in this embedded resolution, we want to keep track of the total inverse image of x sitting inside w. So we want now phi from w prime to w. Again, birational proper morphism. And then you have x star, which is phi inverse of x. And you want that this which consists of many components, has normal crossings. And normal crossings just means meeting transversally as two planes. Though, of course, as you may imagine, this type of resolution implies the abstract resolution by just restricting pi to the component which is the strict transform of x here. So in our, our surface, now you see the exceptional components. After the first blow up, you get this plane, the blue plane. Then you get a green one in addition. You get a yellow one. You get two red ones. And you see the green and the yellow ones, they are already transversal. But the red ones are still tangent to the cylinder. So you will have to do another blow up which I don't show in this picture. Okay? So this is a process you are pursuing geometrically. And you have to make this precise algebraically. So I show you in I show you the equations just to get an idea. It's not important what the formulas are, but you Daisy was our singular surface and it is parameterized by the cylinder, though the parameterization, which is just the map sending the cylinder down to DC, is kind of complicated. You would not guess it. And certainly you would not invent it just by looking at the equation of DC. And here you see the equation of the total transform, or the total inverse image. This here is, no, this here is the cylinder. And then you see here extra components. Okay? And we will use this algebraically later on that you can always factor uh, hypersurface equations 
from the ideal you are interested in. Okay. Maybe I make one remark. For quite a while after Hiranaka's spectacular proof, the resolution of singularities was treated as quite inaccessible because it was so difficult. Now, in the, the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s, there appeared simplified proofs, and people, let's say, a big audience started to understand the, the proof and the the very not surprising, but the fascinating thing is that this good proof is very beautiful. The logical structure is just amazing, and I'll give you a small flavor of this logical structure in the next few minutes. And for this, I have to formulate it algebraically, and this is still a stronger version of resolution, though I have let me call this principalization. Of ideal. And I always stick to the simplest case. <coughs> we have J, an ideal sheaf on smooth W. And then I will start to apply blow-ups to that, this ideal. This ideal will be the ideal defining the singular variety we want to resolve. So when I start to apply blow-ups, I will get exceptional factors. These factors, as they are corresponding to hypersurfaces, are principal ideals. So that's, in this way, I can write, once I have done a blow-up, I can write J as a product of some exceptional factors and the ideal I'm interested in, which corresponds to the strict transform. So, in order to do induction, I write this from the very beginning as a product of ideals. M times I, where M in local coordinates is a monomial ideal, monomial principal ideal, and I, this is the ideal we are interested in, this is a singular ideal which we want to make smooth. So at the beginning, let me write it like this. In the middle, we have J times Mi. At the beginning, you have J just 1 times I. You have no exceptional factor, and you have the ideal you want to resolve. And at the end, you want to interchange the role of both factors. You want to put everything in the monomial part. So at the end, you want to have J equals m times 1, where m is now a monomial, locally a monomial, which means that you have transformed it into a normal crossings divisor. Okay. So, in order to come from here to here, it's obvious that we want to improve i. In some sense. And the statement of principalization or monomalization of ideals is that by a sequence of blow-ups you can transform any ideal of this type into one which is just a principal monomial ideal. Okay? And it's easy to see that 3 implies 2 and 2 implies 1. So in the rest of my talk, I will stick to this problem here, which is now, of course, on the algebraic side. So here you see, here you see this product of ideals one step or two steps before you have completely found this parameterization. You still have to, to do two blow-ups along these lines here, which are the tangency lines, and then, <coughs> then you are done. Okay.
ok so the idea to do this is stratification as we want to apply blow ups we have to specify a center and the center of our blow up will be the locus where the ideal is the worst so specify points in W where I is most singular that's of course not correct English but you understand what I want to say and the stratification can be given by associating local invariance to I define local invariance for I so take care here I start with my ideal J but the interesting factor is I the, strati the stratification will relate to I and not to the monomial factor M there are many options for instance you could take the Hilbert Samuel function you could take the local multiplicity and the easiest one is just the order order of vanishing at a point A now classically in the 1964 paper a substitute for the Hilbert thermal function was defined using standard basis then Bruce Bennett uh, studied the behavior of Hilbert thermal functions on the blow up uh, later on it was realized that also the order of vanishing is sufficient to do induction in characteristic zero so today I will just stick to this one it is sufficient for our purposes so the order of vanishing will give you a locus of points where the order is maximal so let me call this top I these are the points A in W, the order of I maxima. <coughs> now, think of a hypersurface, though I is just the principal ideal. We have one generator F, and you just take the order of the Taylor expansion of F at the point A. So this, this maximum value I will call it O and <coughs> it is easy to see that this locus is closed in W it is closed because you can define it by taking derivatives okay. you take as many derivatives until you go down to something which is order 1 and then you get a system of equations for your locus so the fact is, which is easy to prove, if, if Z is the center of blow up, and this holds up to now, I mean, arbitrary characteristic. And if I prime is a transform of I, and if I assume that the center of blow up is contained in this worst locus and if O prime is the according maximal order of I prime at all of its points then this order does not increase so if it drops you are done because you say I can apply induction on the order so the remaining case is what happens if it is equal now uh, here you are very generous with blackboards I switch to this one so maybe I write this down hence if O prime less than O then we are done if O prime equals O, then we have to look closer.
and now we we will <coughs> look at characteristic zero in the sequel characteristic equals zero and what is very rare in mathematics there's kind of lucky stroke helping us out the lucky stroke is the following I told you that this locus is defined by taking partial derivatives so if you take a suitable O minus 1 partial derivative it will have order 1 this implies that this derivative defines a smooth hypersurface and the top locus is contained in the smooth hypersurface. This only works in characteristic zero. So this is the first thing. Top i is contained in V w w, at least locally. All my arguments are local, but they patch to a global picture. And this is a smooth hypersurface. And you can define it, it's not unique, you can define it by taking a suitable partial derivative. Defined in the hypersurface case by a certain partial derivative. So this is lucky stroke number one. The second observation is if you take your center of blow up inside this top locus, then you only want to look at the points in W prime where this equality holds. And all the points where this happens are contained in the transform of V. So by blowing up, you have a center inside V because it's inside here. You get a transform of V, which is V prime. And already the risk you observed that V prime contains all the points A prime where O prime is equal to O. Let me write this down. After blow up, V prime contains all points A prime where O prime, I hope you can read my O's and A's, equal And moreover, this continues if you do another blow up. And this continues to hold until O prime drops at all points. This is false in characteristic P. And this is false in characteristic P. Does not hold in characteristic P positive. So, I asked Abianka about the origin of this observation. And he wrote me the following email. And Professor Hironaka will correct me if the content of the email is maybe not correct. Dear, etc. the lucky stroke, parenthesis, Chernhaus transformation, or hypersurface of maximal contact, first appeared in my joint paper with Zariski, entitled such and such. <coughs> I imparted this technique to Hironaka when he, parenthesis, as a graduate student at Harvard, here, parenthesis closed, visited me for four days of October 1957 in Cornell University. A parenthesis which I don't mention, Abianka type parenthesis. During these four days, Hironaka and Nagata both were at my house, guests. And Hironaka was constantly asking me questions. And I was replying. I visibly saw 
how much progress a person, parenthesis, Yonaka, parenthesis closed, can make in four days. At the beginning of the four days, I knew more, but at the end of the four days, perhaps Yonaka knew more. <laughs> so, as he will be talking afterwards, he has the chance to correct and to reply. So, once you have this observation, there's a very natural logical structure of proof. And uh, I would like to call it Cartesian induction. And you don't have to know what a blow-up is, even if you know. You just think that's kind of modification which is given. So we start with W. In that W, we have this top locus of I. And inside, we take a center. We take the blow-up of W in Z. So we get the transform W prime. Now here, let's we take a point A in Z. The order of I in, along this top locus will be denoted by O. O equals the order of I at A, which is the same as the order of I along Z. Now, inside W prime, we will choose a point A prime. So, inside you have the, I will denote by Y prime, the inverse image, the new exceptional component. And inside you take a point A prime, and you choose the A prime, so that O prime equals O. O prime is the order of the transform of I at A prime. So locally at A, I told you before, you have this hypersurface V, which contains also Z, which contains A. Okay? So as the center is inside here, you have a blow up of V, which I call V prime. As we saw before, A prime will be inside V prime. And V prime will be a smooth hypersurface inside here. Smooth hypersurface. The construction is local, but smooth hypersurface. Okay. Now here, I have my ideal J M times I. Factorization of the ideal I want to resolve. I take the total transform J star and I factorize it so that I goes to the strict or to the weak transform. So I just take the interesting part. I call this J prime and I factorize it in M prime times I prime. And this order here, O prime is the order of I prime. Okay. This is a picture. And you know that if you take a next blow up, the story continues. As long as the order is the same. Is this clear? I hope. As long as this holds, you always have this hypersurface which comes with you. But now it's clear what you want to do. You want to step down in, in dimension and you want to formulate the resolution problem inside this hypersurface, even though it's only local. And you want to resolve this problem here with the hope that resolving it by induction on the dimension in one dimension less. The hope will be that once you have resolved the problem here, the situation here is so special that maybe you have even a resolution here. So the idea is, transfer the problem locally to one dimension less. I won't be very explicit how you descend in dimension. But the point is that inside V, 
you can define what is called the coefficient ideal, which I denote by j minus in order to indicate that the dimension has gone down by one. And it turns out that this coefficient ideal has again a factorization, m minus times i minus. And this is in V, everything local at A. You can define also this here. So you get J prime minus equals M prime minus times I prime minus. So this is, let me just call it coefficient ideal. There are various ways to do it. You choose one. Go down here. Now this ideal lives in V. So you can apply the blow up. This blow up can be applied to J minus. If you apply it to J minus, you will get J minus prime. Now, take care. Here, I first have the blow up, and then I go down in dimension. Now I go first down in dimension, and then I apply a blow up. And you show that this factorizes again like this. And the center Z, you can choose it inside the top locus of I minus. This is a technical factor I'm not going to explain. But if the center which sits inside V also sits inside the top locus of I minus, we know by the effect over there, what do we know? that the order of this ideal did not increase. The fact implies O minus prime less or equal O minus. But by induction on the dimension, we already know that we can resolve here. So as we know that we can resolve here, this inequality in a sequence of blow-ups once we will have a drop, necessarily. Okay. But that's not sufficient. We want to relate the resolution here to something here. And the main point of the whole argument is the following. If you define the coefficient ideal correctly, and if you look at a point where the order is the same, then I take blue, then you have a commutative diagram. These two are the same. So you can go down in dimension, blow up, or you can go up and then down in dimension. Here I use O prime equals zero. So this is a commutative diagram. So this allows you to say that this ideal here, which is kind of shadow of this one, is improving by induction on the dimension, and then I can go back. Otherwise, I could not go back. That's the heart of the proof, and this only works in characteristic zero. Okay. The rest is technicalities, but the, the main point is this one. So, characteristic P. In characteristic P, and I'm not able to give you a proof, we do the opposite. We look at the worst case. We look at a very simple example where the argument from before does not work. So, for this, I will look only at the purely inseparable case, I will look at the hypersurface. I will write it x to the p plus, I simplify y1 r1, ym rm, g y. y is y1 up to ym. So this will be a generator of my ideal i. 
And uh, <coughs> as you are applying blow-ups, I will always get a factor in front of this, but for the purpose of this exposition, I will cancel it. But this factor here, which again is exceptional, cannot be canceled because it's inside the polynomial. So these are exceptional factors from earlier blow-ups. And now I will give you a list of failures. The first one is the top locus of I, in this case it's just the top locus of F, is not contained in a smooth hypersurface. Need not be inside smooth hypersurface. V. So this was made explicit by a student of Abhyanka Narasimhan. And second, but this is not the, the main obstruction. The main obstruction is that if you look at a sequence of points where the O order O remains constant, then this hypersurface which goes with it will lose the point. So, in any sequence of points A, A prime, and so on, with O equals O prime equals O double prime, and so on, if you choose at the beginning a hypersurface here, maybe not containing the top locus, but you choose one which as a transform containing A prime in characteristic zero, you could choose this hypersurface so that the transform also contains A double prime, and so on. In characteristic P, this does not happen. And even for surfaces, it fails. So any hypersurface going with these points says goodbye at a certain step even though the order is the same, it has moved away. Or said differently, points with the same order appear outside the transform of the hypersurface. So these, in, these are the only points we are interested in. They jump off any hypersurface. They go away. So the induction on the dimension breaks down. And uh, this was the point when I I wanted to know why, maybe something like eight or ten years ago, why the proof of characteristic zero does not work in characteristic P. And if you look at the proofs which existed, you don't see where the reason is. I mean, everybody says maximal contact fails, but I wanted to see it precisely. So I wrote up the proof in all details. Of course, everybody pr writes down his own proof. And then I deleted all assumptions on characteristic zero. And there remains just one space where a problem occurs, and this is here. This point is, so here I have to write jumps of AK, jumps of any hypersurface. Okay? I'm kind of vague here, but excuse me, just to give you the main idea. So in this case, there's a natural thing to do. I thought, let's look at these points and let's try to understand them. And <coughs> the theorem is that you can classify these points classification of these dangerous points and I will give you I don't have a lot of time but I will give you the main ingredients so <coughs> it's the surprising fact is that this type of phenomenon 
happens in very rare circumstances. So let W prime W inside A inside A prime a point a blow up where star happens. This is star. So where the obstruction occurs. Then you have several effects, and these were also observed by other people, some of them at least. A prime, now here in A, you have already blown up 80 times before, so you have a lot of exceptional components. And A will sit on some of them. In order to have the obstruction occur, A prime has to jump off all the components which are here. A prime leaves all exceptional components passing through A. Second, in this type of example, but you can extend it to arbitrary uh, hypersurface, you have here kind of exceptional multiplicities. <coughs> the residues of these exponents, modulo p, are less or equal phi r minus 1 times p, where phi of r is the number of components ri, which are not divisible by p. So in two variables, if you have r1 plus r2, and instead of defining this precisely, you just have the condition less than p, m equals 2. Okay. The third condition You have kind of uniqueness of this equation. The initial form of G is unique, which is kind of strange because you just have, in some sense, a single example where you have a problem. But as you only know the initial form, it does not suffice to resolve by other means this type of equation. And four, the O minus, recall that we had the order of the ideal, we went down in dimension to O minus, so the O minus will be the order of G. You have a result of Mo. O minus may increase. So this over there, you see that the O minus is always bounded by O minus. O minus prime is less or equal to O minus. In characteristic P, it may increase, but at most by one. Okay. So, Mo gave uh, examples where this increase happens. So, if O minus prime is O minus plus 1, you are sure that the induction breaks down. Okay. Now this, this type of dangerous points, I call them kangaroo points, because the exceptional, the point jumps off the exceptional components, and the order jumps upwards. So it seems that Hironaka is using part of the theorem, but he doesn't like the name kangaroo, so he calls them metastatic points. And maybe he will talk about this in the next lecture. So you, you know precisely where the problem is, but this does not help you to solve the problem. Maybe Hionaka can indicate 
a way how to overcome these obstructions, we will see. So in the last two minutes, I will indicate the other approaches. So other approaches. There is one by Villa Mayor. Take a different descent in dimension. The classical coefficient ideal is essentially done by restriction. He is using a generic projection. to hypersurface and the obstruction does not occur. So you can apply your Cartesian induction. Everything works fine, which is already a fantastic theorem. But as you take a generic projection, you lose kind of information. And once you have resolved here, it's much harder to go back here. And that's not done yet. So you can do it here, but you don't know how to profit of it to deduce that you have a resolution here. So it's still open. Then you have, uh, excuse me that I'm very brief here, but Kawanue Matsuki, they, following maybe a proposal of Giraud from the 70s, they look at differential operators applied to F. So let me remark, I erased it, but I will write it again. If you have F equal X to the P plus Y R G Y, you have the following problem that this polynomial here is not unique. It depends on the coordinates and it is only defined up to p's powers because the coordinate change in x will kill p's powers. So this one will live in ky, kyp. And this makes it hard. You have to work inside there. And in order to avoid this obstruction, you take derivatives. If you take derivatives, you kill all p's powers and you get something which in some sense reflects this equivalence class. But you kill more than necessary and again you have a problem. So, to eliminate p's powers. And then Thank you. <laughs>